Hey, what up? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Tonic Accord podcast. I am Alex Kapitko, and I'm joined with my friend and co-host, Drew Nepley. We both met at Chapman University. Oh, man. Going on, geez, seven years ago, I think, if I'm if I'm not incorrect. And, yeah, wow. uh, since then, we always joked about making, yeah, right? Like, it's it's kind of wild. Like, time flies, and it's kind of cool to see that we're, we're still having fun talking about politics this far removed from our freshman dorm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, today, today we are going to get into a, uh, we're going to start off at least with a kind of interesting topic here. And just a little quick background for those who don't know, Peru has had a pretty chaotic time with presidents and leaders over the last couple decades. Um, they until the last year, they were actually kind of a success story in Latin America. Um, the Economist said that from 2001 to 2016, the poverty weight, rate, excuse me, went from 60 percent to 21 percent, and there was average growth in the economy of 5.6 percent per year, which is kind of good because a lot of other Latin American countries in the region have really struggled economically speaking. But then, un unfortunately, the country is super divided. They've had what, four presidents, eight finance ministers in the last five years just alone. Uh, there's a New York Times article that was kind of funny, but also like scary that said that does Peru need a special prison just for ex-presidents? They've had a lot of issues with corruption, authoritarianism, left authoritarianism, right fascism. They've kind of seen it all, but things were going well. But then COVID seemed to hit Peru and it killed over 100, uh, 190,000 people and 3 million fell back into poverty. So Peru was doing great. And then this all happened. So then back in... I believe it was back in November, there was a very decisive problem that happened. There was this guy named Vizcara, who was the president, President Martin Vizcara, and he was removed over corruption charges. And then basically they had an interim president and then another interim president until this election. And that's what Drew and I are going to be talking about today. And so a guy named Pedro Castillo looks to have won against Kiko Fujimori, who is the daughter of another Fujimori, Alberto Fujimori, who was a conservative autocrat who got rid of the shining path. But that's for another episode. But anyways, it looks like as of now, Castillo won. He's definitely kind of a left-wing populist, but he won with what looks like 50.2% of the vote. And so it just shows how divided the country is. And there's a lot of questions on, will he even be able to do anything? So, Drew, sorry, long-winded rant there aside, but um, what do you think about all this, like, just as a first take here? No, I mean, you need you, it's good to have that context. We have to, you know, I, I had to get all this context myself and when we during, re during research for this. Um, but, yes, I mean, Peru um, is in this weird moment uh, where it's, it's it, there's a lot of similarities to the United States, I feel. And there are also some differences. But, yeah, I mean, you have a, a narrow ele election. Um, you have a rural and urban divide, um, you have a, you know, populist movement, and then you also now have claims of election fraud as the, this election has now come to what many believe is a close. Um, Kiko, uh, Fujimori is now claiming that there is fraud. Um, so right off the bat, I notice a trend, uh, and we'll talk a, a bit about Netanyahu probably later, is that like these autocratic style, um, generally more right wing, not always, but generally more right wing, you know, autocrat autocrats, just claim fraud when they lose in elections. Um, Donald Trump being one of them, now Kiko Fujimori, uh, Netanyahu, um, the Belarus president, right? <laughs> Same thing, where it's becoming True. the playbook. It's uh. You don't lose. You, 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 no one loses gracefully anymore. You just, if you lose, you claim election fraud and you fight tooth and nail in whatever facet you have. The problem is, um, you know, while I, I watched a debate um, from France 24 that included, um, pr you know, professors and, and professionals in Peru and, and the Peruvians that understood the system. So, from what I gathered from them, is they don't believe that there will be any serious, like, a challenge like any serious court challenge from Kiko Fujimori, they believe that um, the system will prov like show that um, Castillo won. However, they do they fear that because there's such a c cultural divide and that the election was so close that the rhetoric used by Kiko Fujimori could lead to you know violence in the streets. Um, 
Castillo only won by a very, very slim margin, and half the country feels that he is a uh, a communist threat, even though he has said recently that there will be no communism in Peru and he will be the head of state and not, not some communist from abroad or whatever. You know, there are worries that his left-leaning his his socialist left leaning revolution style um, mimics that of you know Venezuela more so than Evo Morales and and you know that's debatable but that's the fear so all that to say is I see this election fraud BS come up again and then now now I don't know if there is election fraud but from what I understand there's not um, and. It's it's it it can that that rhetoric is going around country to country that can that can really be dangerous and cause people to be violent. Very good point. Very good point. You know, and I think kind of the success of a, these, like you said, it is mainly right leaning autocrats. Lukashenko might be the exception right now, but it is true that. I guess there's always going to be fraud, right? Like when you've, you and I've talked about this time and time again, there's always going to be minuscule amounts of fraud in any election. That's just kind of what happens. Yeah. But basically this burden of proof is not needed by these leaders. Instead, what they're doing is saying, well, if we find any crumb of fraud or any little you know, whisper about fraud, it just muddles the waters. And so basically, I mean, to me, again, it's another one of these leanings towards an autocratic fascism is that if you say the election's fraudulent, your voters believe it, they don't have faith in the next one, and they're willing to do anti-democratic things to do so. Now, I don't, this is, I'm not going to rant about that anymore because I could take us down a whole other conversation, but you're right. It, it is interesting to see that she's doing this. So far, it, it doesn't worry me like other places, especially in the United States right now with these Arizona audits and stuff. But what does worry me about Fujimori is that, you know, if, if Castillo won 50.2% of the vote, that means probably at least 45% or how much more voted for Fujimori or support her. So when he has a weak mandate, if he, you know, ends up winning this, like it looks like he will, it's a bitterly divided country and you don't need them sowing this doubt, especially then when it looks like he's applauded Evo Morales, you know, the embattled ex-leader of Bolivia, um, you know, Maduro in Venezuela, and he even likes communist Cuba. So the thing is, is that I think he's, he's kind of a not ideal candidate to kind of fire up the other side. And so with maybe this mix of division and fraud reports, who knows? I, I do know that in November when... Um, when um when the last guy i'm totally spacing on his name uh, uh biscata was was removed there was violence and chaos on the streets but i think that was mainly with covid lockdowns yeah. but but it's it's going to be it's going to be really interesting to see uh, the the one thing that i that i do think is interesting is that this biscata guy which i just wanted to mention really quick he was he was removed or ousted i guess by congress because of corruption charges and the interesting thing is, is that they accused him of gross negligence in handling the crisis of the COVID crisis. And it was basically using the permanent moral incapacity grounds, which are kind of found in article, some article of Peru's constitution. But the problem is it was all the opposition to him. And basically this permanent moral incapacity is kind of like, what is it, the 27th Amendment, I want to say in the US, where it basically says you can remove the president for not being fit for office. Mm. And so it kind of shows that this this Biscata guy was removed already for partisan means. So I think there's still a lot of anger in the country over, are these elections even real? Like, are we going to get anything done? Yes. And so I just wonder if this, if this guy Castillo can do anything. Well, yeah, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, I also think it's worth noting that Kiko Fushimori is, I think has a corruption charge as well that she's could be facing 30 yeah. years in prison. Uh, and, but one of the things is that that case will be delayed if she wins the election, which again, it doesn't look like she will. Um, yeah. I also, I think it's also worth noting that, um, Castillo is not coming to this government with a majority at all. I think his party only has 37 out of a hundred and something seats of Peruvian Congress. So by, by no means a majority, they're going to have to have some sort of, you know, alliances and coalitions. Um, he, he has an interesting story though. And it, and it shows that like, I think he kind of hit the moment. Like he's the kind of the, the guy for this moment in Peru. I'm not saying I, 
particularly agree with all his politics, but if just looking at what Peruvians see as as a movement of change, he has a really interesting story. He's from he's from rural Peru that's very impoverished. He was a school teacher, um, or still is a school teacher until he becomes you know president elect, um, and he's even vowed to maintain his school teacher salary if he is elected. Uh, and one of the reasons. He, uh, from what I, from who, what he said, one of the reasons he decided to run was because during the pandemic lockdowns, his school was so poor that they couldn't afford, and like no one had, none of the kids had cell phones, no one had tablets, so they couldn't remotely um, do schoolwork, like you know, like perhaps uh, wealthier kids in the cities of Peru, and of course, kids around the world that could afford that in in wealthier countries. So he saw that discrepancy in in the. Um, in, in his in his view, the discrepancy in equality, and he decided to run. So I think he really strikes a nerve and and like touches a lot of people in rural Peru that feel that the urban areas don't represent them. In fact, some r- rural counties had o- over eighty percent vote for Castillo, whereas you know main cities like Lima were two thirds for Kiko Fujimori. So there's a there's obviously a rural urban divide in Peru where the rural areas are much more left-leaning, much more socialist even, um, and want to literally change the constitution. That's something that Castillo has said himself. Um, whereas I think the reaction that I mentioned that the fear of the other half of the people are they don't want to go da- they don't want to go down the path of Cuba and Venezuela. Now it's worth noting again that I think because of how narrow of a margin he won and because of the issues of not having a majority in like the parliament, he's going to have to moderate his left leaning stances, which he has started to do. Uh, one thing I've no- uh, I-, I picked up was that one of his main economic advisors. Let me get it here. Um, is where is he? Well, I, I mentioned one of his economic advisors um, used to work for the World Bank and is working on moderating his policies. When he was in in the first round of elections, he talked about nationalizing a lot of Peruvian businesses. Now he's backed out a bit, maintaining that he's not going to completely nationalize all these resources, but work with businesses to be better for workers' rights. So he's 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 moderated himself a bit. I think he realizes that he can't be a, a Hugo Chavez in this case. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you that, to, like just the start, is that he's definitely not going to be a Chavez or a Maduro just because, like you said, he would need a mandate, and it looks yeah. like he has a pretty limited one at best right now. My my issue, though, is like the, the Economist had a good point when I was reading their article. I think it was just this week on Peru, and they said that kind of Peru's strength, especially going into the 2000s, was that they kind of avoided these nationalist protectionist policies. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that he did, you know, you know, walk back on some of his nationalization of industries, because like the first thing I think of is, you know, kind of this rural leftist who wants to nationalize everything and then economy goes down the shitter. Because Peru doesn't have oil, Peru doesn't have some of the things that, you know, kept Venezuela afloat for these years before they hit hyperinflation. Um, but but my thing is, is that like like this article says, I'll just I'll just read this little part as it said, the government in Peru used a healthy mix of free market economic policies and export led growth, also with strong welfare nets and safety programs that helped the population grow while also opening it up to an export driven economy. And that's just my worry is that I think we're going to see this giant schism right now, this rural urban divide, like you mentioned earlier, is that, you know, Fujimori does resemble and I think that's why she did decently well. Well, maybe there's more to that later, but um, I think she did really well in some ways because it does appeal to Fujimori, her father, Alberto, who was the first Japanese descendant ruler, or not ruler, but president of Peru. And he did cut back on the shining path that I think a lot of people, obviously I'm not saying Castillo is a shining path guy, but a a rural, more left-leaning socialist group that wants nationalization and changes in economics, I think for a lot of Peruvians rings a bell of this time. And, um, right. and I, I just, I just don't think Peru wants to go back to that time, but again, I'm, I'm not defending or not defending either one of them. I just think that Peru was on the right track before COVID and obviously inequality again, and poverty issues are being, being shown with COVID, but I don't know if a rural farmer and school teacher is the best solution. That's just my personal opinion. You know? Well, certainly Peru I mean, enough of Peru thinks he is the way, right? He's won legitimately, but you're right. It's not by much. And um, he's going to have to, I think, like you said, moderate his, you know, um, left-leaning guerrilla tendencies. Not that I don't think he has any actual connection to, like, guerrilla groups, but he 
he the rhetoric is there um it's that slippery slope notion that people are afraid of first it's this guy and next it's the guy wearing the military cap with the red star but then that's but i think he's trying to prove that that's not the case we'll see if it's successful um as you said peru has had a lot of different heads of state very recently so they i'm hoping that they can get on some stable ground um and yeah it's also interesting to see the 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 claims of election fraud which is uh becoming certainly a pattern among the sore losers of the democratic world if i could add one thing just super fast sure um, i i i I totally agree with all that i i think the problem too with this election just something i noticed was that there were 18 candidates in this election and so of course you had a kind of pretty far right Fujimori versus a pretty far left Castillo. And it's unfortunate because there were 16 other candidates who, from what I've gathered, were less extreme than both of them. So it's just kind of interesting that two rad- two more radicals came out of this. It shows how divided the country is, right? It, it, it's, yep. it's evidence to that. Um, uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens.